My name is Jim Manchester. My pronouns are he and him. I'm here to invite you to take a Bible study course that we here at St. John's MCC call the Gospel of the Revelation, according to St. John the Divine. If someone tells you that the world as we know it is doomed to imminent destruction, then you're probably not getting the whole picture of the book of Revelation. If people tell you that your loved ones will be whisked away, leaving you behind if you're not right with God, then you're probably not getting the whole picture of the book of Revelation. In reality, the book of Revelation is a story of unimaginable tragedy and loss. And at the same time, a story of incredible delight and joy, but maybe not in the way you think. We have at least three different ways that we can understand the book of Revelation. We can read it like a Roman would, or like a first century Jew might, or we can read it like the early first century followers of Jesus Christ did read it. What did the early church know about the book of Revelation that many people of today don't? This Bible study class, The Gospel of the Revelation According to St. John the Divine, peels away all the curious, preconceived, mysterious notions we have collected about it over the years and makes it come alive in a way that renews and strengthens our faith. When we look at Revelation with new eyes, with the eyes of God's rainbow people, we see it in a whole new way. We find a dream of an embattled people for which there is much hope. We leave behind the condemnation and judgment that so many would use to abuse us. At 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday, January 7th, we will begin with a vitally important introduction session. And our study begins in earnest the following week. You really need to join us for that first class. The eight week course will be held entirely on Zoom with help from Google Classroom. That means you can join each two-hour class from anywhere in the world, but we must limit the class size to 30 participants. Please register to participate in this course at stjohnsmcc.org. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship here this morning at St. John's Metropolitan Community Church. We are very blessed and excited that you took time this morning to join us for worship on this third Sunday of Advent. This morning, we invite you, if not already done so, to please take a moment to visit our website where you can find out more about St. John's MCC, upcoming events, and ways that you yourself can get involved during this Advent season. We have several op opportunities coming up, including our Blue Christmas service, so please join us and please make plans to attend. This morning, as we prepare for worship, let us take a moment to center ourselves. Hope in a chaotic world. How our world needs hope today. Into a world of violence, occupation, poverty, disease, refugees, religion gone wrong, and more. 
Into such a world came the Christ child, the hope of the world. And so we come to worship today, hoping for the presence of peace. We come placing our faith and hope in the Christ of Christmas, who has come, who is with us now, and who comes again and again. We welcome the advent of incarnational hope. We welcome one another to worship. Good and gracious God, we ask today that you gather us into your presence. Draw us in from this space, from our living rooms, from wherever your people find themselves. Draw us in. Knit our hearts together that we might find refuge in your presence. So much of our world feels unfamiliar. You know that for many of us, we've set our tables for fewer loved ones out of caution, had to close our doors to friends and family. Our homes, unusually quiet, don't roar with festive sound of happy chatter and glad tidings. Your people have faced layoffs, diagnosis, and depression we didn't expect. Your people have seen hurricanes and fires, uncertain transitions, witnessed the uncovering of widespread injustice and woken every day for months to the reality of an ongoing pandemic. Bring to our minds, call to our hearts, all that you have blessed us with. We're thankful for the technologies that have kept us connected to our loved ones and even those that we have lost touch. We're thankful to the communities like this church that have kept on feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, and proclaiming the good news. We're thankful for moments of quiet when it felt like the peace had slowed just a bit and we'd found space to take a look at the world around us, grieve what's been lost, and remember what matters most. We're thankful for the one who prepares a table for all of us and welcomes each one of us in our homes. He is the one who we wait, the one whose advent we eagerly seek, the one in whose name we offer those prayers and who taught us to pray. In God, your name we pray. Amen.
As we come gathered around this table once more, wherever you are, we remind you that this table is open and prepared for you. We invite you now to gather the elements that you have gathered before you as we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion. Welcome to this table of hope and possibility. It is God who welcomes us and says there is enough for all who will come. So let us remember, pray, Bless and receive. You are Emmanuel, God with us. We do not have to wait to celebrate your coming into the world. You are with us in our preparations, anticipation, and our longing. We thank you for your presence. You are our God of peace. You are the one promised long ago who came surprisingly as one of us, as a child. You experienced the fullness of humanity while inviting us into the fullness of divinity. You brought hope to the people you taught, healed and loved. Your life, death, resurrection remind us of that hatred and death are not the final word. The gift of your Spirit nurtures hope beyond words, deep within us. The world of the first century was in chaos, not so different than today. Into such a world came the source of peace and hope, bringing love and joy into our world. You, divine presence, come again and again. Into our chaos, unsettledness, questions, even into our places of fear and doubt, we invite you to come and make yourself known deep within. Help us to live into the gift of Christmas peace. We invite you now to gather the elements you have before you. We offer these gifts to you, God, asking that you bless them and let them be for us the bread of life and the cup of new covenant, true and holy food for this journey. During the feast and celebration of a time death passed over, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, just as we do here today. He broke it saying, This is me, this is my life, opened to you. In essence, he said, Remember me, open yourselves, share your life and your love. Later in the meal, Jesus took the cup of Elijah, the cup of things to come, Again, he gave thanks, and he said, just as we do here today, that he offered this to people gathered around him and saying, this is me, this is my blood, my love, my life force poured out for you and for all people. Drink, remembering me. He was saying for us to share our life energy, our peace with the world around us. Thank you, O oh God, again for the open table that we experience again here today. We thank you for the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, 
Christ has risen, Christ is here, and Christ will come again. Bless us to be able to open ourselves up to share your peace and thus transform the world around us, one relationship at a time. Thank you for this meal and the opportunity to share together with you. Amen. Jesus, you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome here. When your people praise you, you said you draw near. Let our worship tell you you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome. Said you draw me. Let our worship tell you you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome here. Oh, you are welcome here. Jesus, you are welcome here. When your people praise you, you said you draw me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and God's arm rules over all. God's reward is with God, and God's recompense before God. The Lord God will feed the flock like a shepherd. The Lord God will gather the lambs in God's arms and carry them in God's bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. And a more contemporary reading, the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine teacher, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. This is the good news about God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was such a lovely day The sun was shining bright The gentle winds were blowing my way Not a storm cloud in sight And then suddenly without warning 
A storm surrounded my life But even in the storm I could feel the calm And here's the reason why I know the peace speaker I know him by name I know the peace speaker He controls the winds and waves When he says peace be still They have to obey Yes, I know him by name There's never been another man With the power of this phrase By simply saying peace be still He can calm the strongest away and that's why I never worry When the storm clouds come my way I know that he is near To drive away my fears So I can smile and say I know the peace speaker I know him by name I know the peace speaker He controls the winds and waves When he says peace be still They have to obey I know the peace speaker And I know him by name Peace, peace Wonderful peace Coming down from the Father says peace be still they have to obey I know the peace speaker and I know him by name I'm glad I can say I know the peace speaker Yes, I know him by name. Thank you, Michael. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much. And Robbie, thank you for, for that. <clears throat> I have a confession to make. This lesson was extremely hard to prepare. I feel like I'm probably wasting your time as I try to bring this lesson today. I am concerned that no one wants to hear anything about peace in the current political climate. On top of that, we have pandemic. When I chose the third Sunday of Advent to bring the message of Peace, we were well into the middle of a national campaign for president, but it hadn't turned ugly yet. It was contentious, but I figured I could handle it. I was so wrong. <laughs> as the election drew nearer, you and I both watched as the national dialogue became more and more divisive 
In a perfect world, people may have been simply trying to explain the differences in the positions of the major candidates, but what I heard wasn't in a perfect world. I heard people sowing hatred for the other candidate supporters from all sides. I became anxious and fearful. You may have felt that too. Finally, the election came and went, and the results came trickling in. Like many of you, I felt a sense of hope for the future. I thought perhaps now, perhaps now we were ready to mend fences and join in constructive, productive dialogue again. But now, I'm seeing a trend toward vindication and vengeance. Vengeance may have won a battle or two, but it never wins a war. A few weeks ago, I called up Pastor Vance to talk about how I felt about this, to talk about how I believe that no one would want to listen to anything I had to say about peace. On that day, I prayed that something would happen to start bridging the gap, to make people start loving even their political enemies again. I hear and read tiny sparks of it on Facebook, but I don't see a trend. Maybe my prayer is being answered, but I'm not seeing it. Matthew's gospel comes to mind. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the closest relatives to the divine. Matthew's chapter 5, verse 9, and that's my paraphrase. That sounds like a promise to me. Of course, Jesus, our teacher, who was the child of God, taught nothing but peace and love. And then they killed him for it. Under those circumstances, who would want to become a peacemaker? <laughs> Still, let's talk about why Christ followers must become peacemakers. Most of us, me included, like to avoid conflict. That instinct comes naturally to most of us. It was ingrained in me when my dad used to say, you don't want to cross your mother. Interestingly enough, mother said the same thing about dad. So I ended up avoiding any touchy subjects with the very people who were in the best position to guide me in learning how to deal with conflict and critical life lessons. Fear is what fuels that. The fear of being wrong or guilty or fear of being shamed. But when we allow that to continue, everything remains the same making sure things remain stable and serene. Say you're sitting around a table with coworkers and somebody says something extremely insulting about Trump or about Biden. You hear what they you hear that they will turn or no, you fear that they will turn their wrath on you. So you say nothing. Everything remains the same making sure things remain stable and serene in the moment. When out of fear, we avoid conflict and acquiesce to people with different values, we are false peacemakers. Say you have a partner who doesn't do the chores you expect him to do, and you never let him know that you're often disappointed about that. You don't want to rock the boat for fear of damaging your relationship. Everything remains the same, making sure things remain stable and serene in the moment. When out of fear we avoid conflict and appease people, even people we love, we are false peacemakers. 
Say your in-laws have a habit of reminding you that they provided a better Christmas for their son or daughter. So you don't want to invite them into your home at Christmas time. You know that they will heap more shame on you, so you say nothing. Everything remains the same, making sure things remain stable and serene in the moment. When, out of fear, we avoid conflict and avoid people, we are false peacemakers. I could go on and on with examples of how I have avoided conflict in the past. Avoiding conflict makes everyone think I am always happy, that Jim does not have a hateful bone in his body. People say he's never met anyone that he doesn't like. Well, I'll tell you, that's not the case. Very, very few people get to see me when I feel wronged or insulted or feel taken advantage of. Even fewer people get to see me when I react to those things, but I do. Most of the time, it's some passive-aggressive comment that I hope won't be heard by the person who wronged me. <laughs> and I might stew about it for days. After that, I keep running scenarios in my head about how to confront the wrong or insult or about what I should have said to them instead of backing away, muttering my passive-aggressive retort. It's even rarer when I revisit the situation and resolve the conflict in a healthy way. When I do revisit it, the relationship is often cautiously restored. But that's not what Jesus did. When Jesus saw harm and injustice, he said something about it. Normally it was in the form of a parable that taught an important biblical concept about God's love. When the prodigal son's brother objected to the royal treatment that the father gave the lost boy, Jesus pointed out that unconditional forgiveness was the divine way. The older brother felt that the family had been shamed and wanted retribution. But he didn't get it. And look at another story that is told in two Gospels about Jesus and the centurion. This hated occupier of their land, the Roman centurion, the commander of a group of 100 Roman soldiers, came to ask a favor of Jesus, an important favor to him. The disciples and Pharisees were horrified that Jesus would even speak to the man. The Romans had brought much harm and injustice to the Jews. But Jesus' response was to deeply listen to the centurion's request and heal his young companion immediately, giving the man the greatest praise that he had given any other man including the disciples. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10 says, When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who follow him, Truly, I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus was moving past the justifiable anger and hurt that the people had for their Roman occupiers and was making peace. I have a close friend who recently was walking down in downtown Raleigh when he came across an angry man who was physically and verbally abusing a woman. My friend is not one to turn to, to back down when he sees injustice, so he stepped in to confront the man's abuse. For a moment, for just a brief moment, that man was abusing him instead of the woman. 
giving her an important chance to get away. His peacemaking response was classic. He said, it sounds to me like you're really angry about something. That's all he said. The whole situation could have escalated into an all-out war right there on Fayetteville Street. Instead, my friend offered to open a different dialogue one where the man's true fears could come out and differences could be resolved. The author Thomas Watson painted a vivid picture when he wrote, Satan kindles the fire of contention in people's hearts and then stands and warms himself at the fire. I imagine... I imagine that someone who sows evil and hate enjoys seeing the result in me. He enjoys seeing how anxious I get when I pass a Trump sign or flag that still flies in my neighborhood. And then he enjoys seeing how sad I am whenever I see another Facebook post from a friend who wants nothing but retribution from the Trump campaign now that the winner has been decided. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that people should be forgiven for their acts of evil, hatred, and injustice without consequences. There are consequences when people sow discord and division. I encourage you to go back to the message that Reverend Polly gave us just last week about justice and listen to everything he said again. What I am saying is that while that process is ongoing, there is much room for peacemaking between people who have vehemently disagreed with each other. Let the people who make justice do their godly work, help them when we can, and then go about making peace. To start the process toward purposeful peacemaking, we will have to first of all recognize where the problem is. To do that, we have to understand where our own feelings come from. What's causing us to be afraid? And then once we figure that out, We need to figure out a way to own our problem in the situation. And then deal with the conflict early. The longer it festers, the more resentment we we feel. The more anger builds up, the more time a chance has happened to have it just come boiling over in some volcanic activity. And that's not peacemaking. And then we need to practice restraint, especially with our speech. (laughs) I love the way that Captain Catherine Janeway handles conflict on the starship Voyager. She always seemed to have the ability to deflect the anger and respond in a sensitive way. And then then we have to prepare for a long journey if we are to reconcile our differences and restore relationship. We often find that we have much more in common than we think. And that's the technique that Captain Janeway used most often. In spite of all the differences, that people had on Voyager's journey, she was able to find some things or needs that they all seemed to have in common. So she used them to find a bridge. Then take the first step toward peace. Take that step by realizing that we understand. 
We show empathy for what the other person is feeling. And we repeat that back to them to let them know that we do understand. Take that first step. And then we aim for humility, not humiliation. Peacemakers always aim at humility and never, never aim at humiliation. Think about the father in the story of the prodigal son that I mentioned before as he was returning home. There's not a single hint of the father rubbing the son's nose in the dirt of his own failure. No, he embraces the son. Don't you want to be more like that father? When we have been wronged, ask ourselves what we really want. Do I want vengeance for the other person to squirm? Do I want vindication for me to be proved that I am right? Or do I want to make peace? Those are three very different things. People who want vindication or vengeance cannot make peace. If we want to see someone who has hurt us grovel in the dust, we are just simply not ready to be a peacemaker. Finally, and there's probably more, but we've run out of room here. Trust the injustice you have suffered to God and to the process of dealing with the consequences. There will be a price to pay. But if you handle conflict conflict well, that price will be very, very much worth it. And let God handle that. Now, these things are for the big things that often happen on a national and regional scale. But they also happen when a coworker tells your boss about, uh, tells your boss a lie about a project that you're working on, on, and, and, and you know they're telling that lie. Or maybe a friend doesn't show up when she promised she would. Or perhaps you overhear someone call Trump or Biden a cruel or derogatory name. And you just say nothing, even though you think insulting people on a personal level isn't right. Those are examples of small local things that might need our peacemaking attention. But let's say you're uncomfortable about trying to be a peacemaker. I'll admit it's scary and it requires a lot of courage to do this kind of thing with people who are in your orbit but not really close. And you certainly are afraid about how some stranger might react to your brand of peacemaking. You might find it easier to join with others and there are lots of groups who engage in peacemaking. One of my favorite examples is the Religious Coalition for a Nonviolent Durham. They have a program where they send a team of prayer warriors to sit with and help the families of murder victims deal with their intense grief. Those families should not have to grieve alone. And the coalition's teams help the families channel their raw emotions away from vengeance. And the coalition has another program that provides teams of people to mentor recently released criminal offenders so they can learn better choices than the ones that sent them to prison. A very good friend of mine leads that program in Durham. I'd love to see a similar program here in Wake County. If you're interested, contact me and I'll put you together with him. Now, another program that originates right here in Wake County that does amazing work is the North Carolina Interfaith Power and Life Council 
that's organized by the North Carolina Council of Churches. They particularly deal with environmental issues, but more than that, they connect the faith voices of North Carolina around climate change, around in, in, encouraging mitigation of the effects and resilient communities through its programs and engaging in public policy about climate and, and cons uh, conserving resource policy by advocacy with compassion. They take action for the future of our children and for the children of all species. And of course, all of the programs that St. John's MCC is helping our community, they're all spreading peace. We help people experiencing the despair of homelessness find safety and hope. Those who live in the shadows of their closets, no matter what that looks like for them, can find light here at St. John's MCC. Those who face the hatred of system systemic racism that we find out that we love them and want to help. The ways that we serve the community spreading peace go on and on. And you know what to do to get involved in that. It takes a whole community of people to encourage peace in our world. When you're done, when you've done some peacemaking with a group, perhaps you'll find the additional courage you need to step out on your own. I encourage you to be a peacemaker as often as possible. St. Francis offered this famous prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine teacher, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it's in dying that we're born to eternal life. By the way, there are consequences to being a peacemaker. My friend, the one who confronted the abuse on Fayetteville Street, believes that is where he contacted the COVID-19 virus. It's the only time he was face-to-face -face with someone not wearing a mask. He was wearing his own mask, but it wasn't enough. He is a COVID survivor, but he continues to suffer the ill effects. Those first three days of fever and nausea were terrible. As of this moment, he's still in quarantine. Jesus intervened in the wrong he saw in Palestine of his day, and they killed him for that. The cost to you probably won't be as great, but I encourage you to make the effort. Your reward may be an enduring legacy of love and compassion that will outlive you. Let us follow in Jesus' steps and become passionate about peacemaking. Let us work toward a purposeful
taking time for you? Are you asking those questions as you journey towards that peacekeeping? Let us know how we can help you. Let us know if we can be in prayer with you. There are tools on our website for you to be able to, to request prayer, to request uh, communication from one of our pastoral care ministers. We're here with you and for you through this. So let us know how we can best do that. We're here at the time when we uh, call for generosity, when we uh, invite you to give back. One of the many ways we do that is through the giving of our financial offerings and tithes. Uh, you can do that through giving uh, links that we have on our website. You can also text St. John's MCC to 77977. Again, that's St. John's MCC to 77977. That'll give you a link straight to our giving page. You can also find that on our website. We also have many ways for you to get involved through volunteering and through other uh, ways of being able to give back to help be an instrument of peace. We encourage you to look and find the ways that you can be involved, the way that you can be yourself an instrument of peace. Each one of us plays a critical role in being able to do the work that we do here each and every day, and we're so appreciative of all that you do to allow us to be, for the community, the church that God called us to be as we prepare ourselves to leave this place and go about our day, wherever you may be, we pray that God goes with you, that you take that instrument of peace that you have been called and created to be and take that with you into the world around you, being all of who God called and created you to be. And until we meet again, know that God loves you and know that we love you. Amen. And leave each moment in peace.